Good morning, it is Sunday, April 16th, 2023, and I'm Pastor Mark Dilley of West Valley Grace Fellowship. I pray that the message this morning will be used to strengthen you in your faith and encourage you in your walk with our Savior and Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's open our Bibles or follow along on the sheet, whichever one you prefer, to Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law, and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And I'd just like to add something there. That if could be changed to since, because Paul is talking to believers in Jesus Christ, and so they do live in the Spirit. And we're going to develop that a little more in a minute. So, since we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, shedding his sinless blood, that we might, by faith, trusting in his death for our sins, receive the gift of eternal life. And we praise you and thank you for it. And so we gather here in the name of Christ to worship you in spirit and in truth. And so we commit this time to the keeping of your grace. Use it for your glory. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The fruit of the Spirit could sort of be called the end game of sanctification. We often talk about when you trusted Christ as your Savior, believing He died for your sins, when you believed that, the Spirit took up residence in your life. And that Spirit then is working in you to will and to do of God's good pleasure. And this is God's good pleasure that we bear these fruits in our life. And so we can put our salvation up on the shelf because it's we're saved, sealed, and secured by God's grace for all eternity. And now, how do we live? And so having been saved by faith, only those who are saved can bear this fruit. There seems to be sort of a designed order in the way that Paul put these down, and I don't mean to try to read his thoughts, but it comes first when we, when we are saved, we're saved, God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that love now resides in us as one of these fruits, we can now love as Christ loved us. And we're commanded, even though we're not under the law, to love one another, especially the brethren. Sometimes that's a challenge. But anyway, let's look at Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14. The Apostle Paul, is, this is one of his prayers, and he says, For this reason... I kneel before the Father, from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now that's not talking about the fact that Christ already dwells in us, this is talking about that Christ would be at home in your life. That you have come to a place in your faith 
where Jesus Christ, you recognize him as your source, as your power. You recognize him as everything, and there's no part of your life that you're living that you say, no, uh, Christ doesn't belong there. Uh, I, I don't preach on this very often, but if there is sin in your life that you're being convicted about by the Spirit of God, and you're saying, yeah, but I still like it, give me a couple more weeks, or let me do it one more time, or something like that, Christ is not at home with that. You're really denying him his full lordship in your life. And I'm not talking about any specific sin or any person or anything like that. But every believer has those times when the Lord convicts you of something and you are in denial. Or you are saying, no, I, I, don't, I, I don't believe that or I don't want that. Rather than yielding your life to him and saying, Lord, whatever it is, my heart's desire is that you would be glorified in my life. And if this is sinful, if this is wrong, whatever this conviction is, I present it to you. Do whatever you have to do in my life that you will be glorified. That's the kind of love that's present in us now, that we're willing to die to self, that God might be glorified in our lives. As we're told in the scriptures, no greater love has any man than this that he lay down his life for his friends. Well, for us, what a privilege it is to lay down our earthly existence and give it to God. To say, whatever there is in my life, Lord, that is not pleasing in your sight, whatever it is that's inhibiting me in any way from glorifying you, I desire for you to take it out of my life. That I might walk today in the Spirit. And so, going on here in uh, this verse, in back in Ephesians, the second half of 17. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and how long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. When that love is being manifested in your life, the fruit of the Spirit flows from that. And that starts to produce the joy that we have in this life. Not in our earthly things, not the, the joy of winning the Super Bowl, or not that type of thing, but a eternal, stable, continuous state of contentment and peace in your life. That's the result of that love. And so going on here, verse 20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Again, as I mentioned in the past, when a person is saved and comes to this knowledge of trusting Christ, realizing he is everything in your life, then to give your life to Christ is a privilege. And then to recognize that you can't live this life. You can't obtain to the standards that are being expressed here. So you have to die to yourself. You have to admit that there's nothing I can do, God, except trust you. And that's what Paul's praying for them. I don't see how it could be any clearer that God would give you the power. And that should be the prayer in your life. Lord, strengthen me so that you will be glorified. Not so that I'll be recognized in any way. Not so I will stand tall in somebody else's eyes. I don't really care anymore what the people think of me. And that's in the spiritual side. In the fleshly side, I still struggle. 
a little bit. But I'm learning. It's time I should be. I'm old enough. But anyway, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And so now we, having experienced that love through the salvation we've received from God and recognizing how much he loves us. And can you imagine uh, the, the glorious gospel of the grace of God that God has now said, and this is what, oh, I see so many people sort of take a step back when I share this with them. You can do anything you want to do as a believer in Jesus Christ. You're not under the law. All things are legal for you. God's not going to punish you for anything you will ever do again. The Lord Jesus Christ took all of that punishment. But people, first of all, I think that people that don't have the Spirit of God living in them for sure, and people that don't truly understand grace, immediately say, oh, you're saying we can go out and do anything we want to do. And I'm saying yes. And they just can't get it. But do I want to go out and do all those things? No. I don't want to go out and chase wild women. Probably, probably because I'm a little too old. But anyway, I don't have any desire. The things I used to love when I was 22, unsaved, are repulsive to me today. It's got nothing to do with me. The Spirit of God has shown me those things. And my life prior to my salvation continues to grow more repulsive to me. What I thought was such a great thing was nothing but fleshly exaltation and fleshly desires to promote me. Many saved people yet today don't understand grace in its pureness. And they don't understand the ask him, uh, that baptism thing. I talked to a, a beautiful young girl yesterday, and uh, she's the youth pastor at a church, and I had a wonderful discussion with her, and I was saying things, and her eyes would go like this, and quoting scripture to her about Paul, and grace, and love, and freedom, and all that, and she's in a church that's a little more legalistic, and focused on experience, and gifts, and all of those types of things, and it's such a privilege to know the gospel of the grace of God in its pureness. To see what Paul said. The confusion comes when you put yourself back under what Christ taught. Christ taught the law. He lived under the law. And the law is very clear. If you do this, I will bless you. If you do this, I will punish you. That's not the gospel of the grace of God. Here's what the gospel of the grace of God says. I have saved you with the precious blood of my sinless son. I bought you with a price. Glorify me in your body. And I give you the freedom to choose whatever you want to do with your life. I will never forsake you. I will never leave you. There's nothing in all the world that can ever separate you from my love. Now go live your life. And if the Spirit of God lives in you, or if you're a believer, since the Spirit of God lives in you, He is working in you to change your life. I didn't change. Can the leopard change its spots? I didn't change my life. That's what shocks so many people. They look at me, well, you're not the Mark Dilly I remember. And I'm not. But that's what love does and when you start to experience this work of the spirit in you it brings a great joy there's nothing in my life that means more to me than the opportunity i had to talk to that girl yesterday and quote scripture to her i would trade that for winning the super bowl or anything to do god's sovereign work to be involved in his ministry is the highest calling. And don't think I'm saying this because I'm the pastor. I'm saying it because every one of you should have that desire too. To tell others what you know. And that's why it's so important we grow in the doctrine, in the right ingredients or the right recipe to live this life the way that God has designed it for us. 
And now, don't take me wrong, as I have to always add this, in case there's some gainsayer out there. Don't be deceived, though. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you shall reap. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily everything in the spiritual realm, even though it is true, but in the physical realm. If you're going to abuse your body with things that you shouldn't be involved with, if you're going to live a lifestyle that's not conducive to be healthy, it's sort of ludicrous to think, well, if I pray to God now, he'll heal me. I have a freedom. I can choose how I want to live, and I will reap the results. But as far as spiritually is concerned, that will all be taken care of at the Bema Seat of Christ. When we all stand before him, and I don't know, I don't think it's going to be a big theatrical demonstration or anything like that. It's going to be one-on-one, -on -one, I believe. And that's just what I believe. That's all that matters to me right now. Don't take it because I believe it. But we're all going to stand before Christ and be humbled once more. And yet filled with joy because of what God has done in us and through us and for us. And it says every person will receive the praise of God. So don't doubt about the future. It's glorious. Beyond, as we just read here, anything we can think or imagine, that's our future in Christ. While we're still here on earth, we've got some struggles to deal with. So the, after love, it comes joy. And it's a comforting presence of gladness and delight with thanksgiving. Some of the things I was just talking about, as I looked out the audience, I could see that joy. I could see people rejoicing or just sort of kicking back and saying, boy, this is just like the sunlight before it gets to July or August. But when, we're going to grow in our joy. Our joy is going to continue as God spends the ages showing us his unsearchable riches in Christ, the riches of his grace. And so, being the fruit of the Spirit, this joy germinates in a person when he believes the gospel of salvation and continues to grow through the power of the Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, Paul says, you became imitators of us and the Lord and of the Lord but it's important to understand that he didn't say you became imitators of the Lord first. You became imitators of Paul because he was imitating Christ. A lot of people talk about, well, I follow Christ. But we follow Christ also. But we follow Christ as Paul follows Christ. Not as Christ taught here on earth. Not as Christ taught his disciples. Now, we can look at the life of Christ, we can listen to what he said, and we can be taught and we can learn from all of that. But our pattern of life comes through the Apostle Paul living his life the way that Christ instructed him. And so he goes on to say, you became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering." You welcome the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And I'm here, I believe this with all my heart, the joy that we have is not dependent upon our circumstances in this world. It's not dependent upon any specific situation in our lives other than in the spiritual realm. In I believe it's God's desire for us to get our priorities aligned so the spiritual realm comes first and it works its way out in our life, in our <coughs> earthly realm. And so often what is going on today, we're trying to use the earthly realm to be blessing us and asking God to bless us through the earthly experiences. I need more money, God. I need to be cured from cancer. 
I need this. You, know, you can pray for everything. But the real prayer, I think, should be in everybody's life, give me the strength, Lord, to glorify you in everything. And then walk by faith. Live it. And there should be no guilt in our lives because we don't have any power. We really don't have any investment in it. God invested the blood of his son for us. And now he said, you belong to me, glorify me in your life. And I don't have the power to do that other than yielding myself back to him and saying, Lord, here I am. Use me for your glory. And so having trusted Christ as Savior, the, now, the individual is now spiritually and harmoniously integrated with God. This union produces an increasing sense of joy and well-being in our inner man as we grow in the knowledge and understanding of the word of truth, the gospel of the grace of God. This spiritual joy transcends our circumstances so that we can rejoice always and in any circumstance. I don't know about your salvation, how old you were, or when you believed it, or anything like that, but in my own experience, I was 33 years old when I truly understood that Christ died for my sins. And I understood that first because I knew I had a ton of sins. I was 33 years old, and I was raised in a religion where all I had to do when I thought I had a bunch of sins was go see the priest, I guess they just will be blunt. I was raised Catholic and go to confession, confess your sins. And there was a catharsis in that psychologically, mentally. I felt like I'd been cleansed. But I also walked out of there knowing that, hey, it's Saturday and I got a lot of plans for tonight. Knowing that I wasn't even going to make it till Sunday morning until I had another one on my account. And in that, all that process, I wasn't planning on talking about this, but a lot of my Catholic friends were right there with me. I don't know why, but when it came Sunday morning, my folks told me to go to confession Saturday night. I went to confession Saturday night. I got up and went to church on Sunday morning. All my buddies did the same thing, and we did the same thing Saturday night, and they're all going up to communion, and I'm not. And I don't take any pride in that. It's just for some reason, I've always sensed the fear of God. And I knew I'd sinned again, and I guess I'm a rules guy. And so my sin had separated me from God. And I knew I wasn't fit. I believed these things to be true, and I knew I couldn't take communion because I wasn't in a state of grace, they call it. A sinless life. It, now, as I look back at those things, it's it's ridiculous. But anyway, that's what they teach. And so I would go, and my mother, I love my mother. She is a wonderful Irish Catholic lady. She'd sort of nudge me with her elbow. Didn't you go to confession last night? I said, yeah. She said, well, why aren't you going up there? I said, I forgot to drink some water. Because when I was going to church, when you went to confession, from midnight till mass, you couldn't eat or drink anything. Another one of man's commandments. But instead of being in a state of grace, I just lied to my mother now. So, <laughs> next, I'm already on the way down the hill again. I mean, it's just ludicrous what man does in the eyes of religion and in the ignorance of God's righteousness. And I don't say this to be spiteful or mean to anybody, but I'm just sharing how ridiculous so much of religious practices really are. And when I talk to people, um, I try to keep focused on what the Bible says. And they say a lot of things like, well, I've always believed this. And can you show me where that is in the Bible? Well, no, but it must be in there someplace. Well, or... Father Pat said this, or Pastor so-and-so said this, and I've always liked that. Those things are irrelevant. What does the word of truth say? And that's where your faith should be. 
And so there is a joy for those of us that truly understand the gospel of the grace of God, that truly understand the great salvation that God has given us in his son. And it gives us a love, a love that is beyond description. And in that love comes a joy, a joy knowing Christ. When I got saved, I don't trust in the experience, but that was my experience. When I got saved and I knew that I was saved, I just felt like my body was drained. And I, I just felt free for the first time. That I didn't have to have a guilty conscience anymore. That I didn't have to think I was hiding things because I knew God knew it all anyway. I didn't have to put on a facade. But it takes years and years to start to live that life. It takes a long time to get to a place where I don't care what somebody says about me. It doesn't matter. The only thing that really matters is God. And so he tells us, don't pass premature judgment before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things hidden by darkness and reveal the inner motives. Have you ever heard somebody say, oh, that person's a good Christian? They're basing it on the way they're acting in public usually or the way they piously hold their hands in church or something like that. We don't really know what's in that person's inner being, if they're saved or not, anything like that. And it's irrelevant. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, people often talk about, well, I'm, you're, you're scaring me. Maybe I'm not saved. I don't have that power. I'm not judging anybody if you're saved or not. That's between you and God. Only you know that. But here's what the scriptures say. And if they're threatening to you, then you need to be concerned. If something in the scriptures is threatening you, then you need to get in touch with the Lord and see what he's saying in that regard. So, I am greatly encouraged in all our troubles. My joy knows no bounds. That's what the Apostle Paul says. That should be what we would say also. In the King James Version, it says this. In 2 Corinthians 7, 4, I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding, and it really means super exceedingly joyful in all our tribulations. When Paul was preaching this marvelous gospel of grace, he was probably the most hated man on earth at that time. It's just amazing. When Christ walked on this earth, here was God in the flesh, the perfect human being, and they hated him without a cause. The ratio of those that heard him and responded by faith is so minimal compared to all the people that heard him. And then they turned against him in an instant and said, crucify him, crucify him. On what ground? The only grounds it could be is their own guilt. That they didn't want to deal with their sin. And that's the nature of man. So if you're saved today, thank God for his grace. And so in Philippians 2, 17 and 18, Paul says, But even if I'm poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and I rejoice with you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. The teaching of scripture, particularly in the dispensation of the grace of God, is that our lot as believers is going to be suffering. But to know that those who live righteously in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You can expect it. And you can also expect persecution just by living in the sinful world. It's just the way it is. But we can rejoice in that because we've got a higher hope. We've got a higher plane of existence. I don't need anything this world can offer me ever again. Why would I sacrifice the integrity of Christ to do something openly dishonest or openly corrupt 
It just shouldn't be that way. And yet, we, it, because of our nature, we're always prone to that happening to us. That's why we need to become so dependent upon God and practice His presence in our life every day. Romans 5, 3, and 4. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. So that's sort of the maturing process in all of this. And then Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7. And I must say that this is my great psychology text. It, it is so precious to me. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. It's better than that. Do not worry, be happy. That song that was so popular. Well, that's basically what it's saying uh, in worldly terms, what this is. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And that's where we'll stop today, because the next verse that follows that, it doesn't say that present your request to God and you'll get whatever you pray for. It's not like what Christ said, you, if you ask anything in my name, my Father which is in heaven will do it. Paul's not saying that here. He's going to tell us, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God that passeth all understanding will fill your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so we'll pick it up next week on peace, Lord willing. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to know you. If there is nothing else in this life but knowing you through your Son, everything else doesn't matter. But you've ordained it that when we're saved, you don't take us to be with you yet. But you've given us the privilege and the honor to glorify you in our lives. And so, Lord, I pray that each one of us would respond to that desire and that we would yield ourselves to you. Whatever it is, we always trust in you and to give it to you for your purpose and your glory and that we would have the power to walk by faith. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.